رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد. Regarding today's درس the دروس from now on including today's درس will not be fun دروس meaning when we look at the earlier سيرة دروس and we saw the great victories from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the يعني, people entering Islam and all those those were fun durus. then when we looked at the Khilafah of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman radiallahu anhum until the end of the Khilafah of Uthman radiallahu anhu there were fun durus. there were victories against Romans and Persians and the Muslims were uh, a united body today's dars and most of the durus from now on will have some things that are very disheartening they're, they're painful to study and at the same time I would say if you ask me it is close to being wajib on the Muslims to know this why? because of all of the issues of aqidah that come out of this because of all of the political realities that we are facing today that have their roots in these incidences because of the important aspects of fiqh that come out of this and the confusion in the Muslim ummah of what happened in those times to clarify that I would say it's close to wajib on the Muslims to understand that because what happens is when Muslims don't understand what happened between Ali and Aisha radiallahu anhum and Muawiyah and Hassan radiallahu anhum then what happens is that people start to make their own mindsets and sometimes they start to criticize some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum or they try to justify things that are not justified or they use those times and places and incidences for example Karbala and things to divide the Ummah and for the Muslims to be able to refute those types of misunderstandings I would say are almost at the point of wujub of learning before I begin today's dars I will make uh, another point and this is a point in Aqeedah and a point in Ilm al-Rijal and a point in history for us Awwalan kama qal Imam al-Suyuti as Imam al-Suyuti says al-usul ma' sahaba what is the usul of the Ahli sunnah wal jama'ah dealing with sahaba al-sahaba kulluhum udul the sahaba all of them had adal. They were all of the best moral character. Unless somebody is an open munafiq, as told to us by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, like Abdullah ibn Salul and others, those are not considered sahaba, because the Prophet ﷺ told us that he's a munafiq and he himself admitted, and some other people like this. But everybody who was a mahajir or an, an, from the ansar. And from the Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam All of them, we do not criticize their character They are all Udul Their Adal is undoubtable, their moral character Secondly, our attitude towards the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum Is they are above our criticism We cannot sit and criticize them And I'll give you a few examples uh, As the Ulema of Islam have given For example if there are two friends that are of older age I have friends I've been friends with for 20 years, 15 years here in the masjid if me and one of them gets into a discussion or a heated argument and if my son or his son gets up and curses him or his son curses me I will be the first one to slap my own son and he would be for his son to tell them look this is a discussion Amongst friends that are much older than you, you are too young to involve yourself in this, to try to criticize one of us. Let us deal with it. But this is an example of just an older friend and children. Imagine the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. If they had a disagreement amongst themselves, it is for them to deal with. It is not for us to criticize. Tayyib. 
In Zadul Ma'ad, Ibn Al-Qayyim al jawziyah he gives an example. And uh, my own Shaykh, Shaykh Amin Allah, he referred this to Shaykh uh, Imam uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. But Ibn Al-Qayyim says, Qal ba'd salaf Some of the Salaf said, and I saw this referred to other Salaf in other books. But it's a beautiful example. He said the example of the fitna between the Sahaba is like an irritation in your eye. The rule is, don't take your fingers to your eye. Yani, if you have an irritation, don't rub your eye. The more you rub it, the worse it will get. So the issue between the Sahaba, we learn it, we understand it, but we don't get involved in trying to point fingers. We don't take our fingers to them. Because it only makes things worse then. Okay? It's kind of a deep uh, example. Inshallah, if you ponder upon it, it you will, will understand by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we do not criticize any of the Sahaba. Radiallahu anhu. They are the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose. Allah is pleased with them. We do not criticize them. At the same time, we will study what happened in the light of authentic ahadith. Ahadith not necessarily of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but the incidents of Sahaba are also ahadith. They are mawquf ahadith. This is the incidents of Sahaba. They are checked with asaneed and ilm al-rijal just like the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So by looking at what is authentic, we will learn about it. But none of that should be taken as a criticism. Tayyib. We were at a point in the Khilafa, in the beginning of the Khilafa of Ali radiyanhu. And we spoke about that none of the Sahaba disagreed with Ali radiyan being the Khalifa. The Khilaf between the Sahaba came on the priority of punishing the murderers of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And all of the Sahaba agreed that the people who murdered Uthman radiallahu were people, dhullam, they were oppressors, and they should be punished. This is the laws of Allah. And this was the haqq of Uthman, and the haqq of this ummah, that when the Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa, was massacred in a way where he was not at fault at all, and he didn't even defend himself trying to save the ummah from bloodshed, that those murders should be brought to justice. But without knowing exactly who was involved in the actual murder, the issue came to priorities. Aisha Taradiyanha and Zubair ibn Awam and Talha ibn Ubaidullah and other of the Sahaba like Abdullah ibn Zubair, the mahram of Aisha Taradiyanha, they went, as we discussed, to Basra. And we talked about how the niyyah that they went with was a niyyah of islah. Islah bain al-nas. To bring peace between the people. And their niyyah was from what they knew, the murderers of Uthman radiallahu anhu, the actual murderers, not the four to 20,000 people, the actual murderers had fled to Basra. So they said, we will go there, we will find who they were, and put them to a punishment as is the haqq of Allah, as from the laws of Allah, and then there'll be islah, and there'll be no fitna between the people. When they went, some of the khawarij started a battle with them, and the sahaba, which was Zubair ibn Awam and Talha ibn Abaydullah, were victorious. They were victorious. And they took over Basra and these areas, and again, they did not revolt against Ali radiyan. They had no problem with giving bay'ah to Ali radiyanhu. But the issue was that before bay'ah, they wanted to make sure that this murder was accounted for. That was the first priority in their mind. Having not known the full picture, again, remember, there is no live CNN, Fox feed going on here. There is only news going back and forth. Ali Radian, who was trying to bring the Muslims together in this time of fitin in Medina, he heard about this fight between the Muslims. Even though the ones that initiated were Khawarij, but again, we are looking at it from hindsight. As I say, uh, vision is 2020 in hindsight. When you're looking back in history, it's very clear, oh, you should have just kicked out the Khawarij. But they didn't know the Khawarij at that time. They had the appearance of pious people. They made salah, they fasted, they made qiyamul layl, they read the Qur'an. Yani, so, apparently, they had given bay'ah to Ali, 
radiallahu anhu, and they were Muslims. They had a secret agenda of creating a fitna that was not known. So not knowing this, Ali Radian, from the news he got that there was a fight between Muslims. So he said, I want to go make Islah bain al nas Looking at the ahadith on this issue. The same words that were used by Ali Radian on this leaving Mecca, going to Baqra, were the same words and the same niyyah used by Ali ibn Abi Talib who leaving Medina, going to Baqra. Both of them had the same niyyah to make Islam bain al Ali Rabiyan said, we're not going to go fight. This is not to go fight. We're going to go and stop any fighting between the Muslims. We cannot have bloodshed between Muslims. As he was setting out from Medina, many of the Sahaba they told Ali Radiyan, don't go. They advised Ali Radiyan not to go. Including Abdullah ibn Salam, the great alim from the Sahaba that used to be a Yahudi and become a Muslim, and he was an alim, a very knowledgeable Sahabi. He told Ali Radiyan, don't go. Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu. Hassan. No people like Hassan, Hassan. Eh? Hussein, Hassan, Hussein. Do you know? Look at the Sahih Ali. Hassan. Ibn Ali radiallahu anhuma told his father Ali radiallahu anhu that my father, you didn't listen to me before, listen to me now. Because Hassan had told Ali radiallahu anhu, don't start accepting the bay'ah until all of the Muslims have come to one agreement regarding the killers of Uthman radiallahu But Ali radiallahu seeing in his ishtihad the priority to keep the ummah united, started accepting the bay'ah. He said, we'll deal with the murder, but we need to deal with the Ummah first. Hassan Radiyan told Ali Radiyan again, that I'm telling you don't go. It will cause more fitness. Ali Radiyan told his son, the first time I didn't listen to you, is because I understood in my ishtihad the importance of keeping the Ummah together. If the bay'ah is not given, the Ummah will split apart. And we don't want to see the Ummah split apart. It has to be kept under the Umur of Banna. So, I took my istihad over your advice. And today, I'm not going to accept your istihad, your, your nasiha, because my istihad is that as the Amir al-Mu'mini now, it is a greater responsibility for me to go there and stop the fighting between the Muslims than to sit here and not, and be afraid that I may get involved in some business. The, the Sahaba that were there, and the very few Sahaba were there, that were in this discussion. All of them decided not to go with Ali Radiyan. They stayed back in Medina. And as Ali Radiyan was going, the Tabi'un that were there, they asked Ali Radiyan, are we going to fight? He said, no. Ali Radiyan said, we're not going to fight. We are going to make Islam between our brothers. They said, what if we get attacked? Ali Radiyan said, we will not even defend ourselves. This was his niya. Leaving Medina. As Ali Radiyan went on, the people drew with his group. As Ali Radiyan who continued on his trip, the people grew with his group. They started, more and more people started to join Ali Radiyallahu Anhu. As people grew, many of the Khawarij joined this group. Again, they didn't have titles. It's not like they were walking around with a big fan. They said, Ana Khariji, right? I mean, we know about them through history now, but at that time, they were just Muslims. And they said, we are just Muslims. We, we say the Shahada, we make Salah with you, we give Barah, we want to go with you. So many of them joined the ranks of Ali radiallahu anhu. And they moved towards Basra. When they got there, Ali radiallahu anhu sent one of the Sahaba who he called to join him. And this is Sahabi Qaqa'a radiallahu anhu, who we spoke about Qaqa'a ibn Amr radiallahu anhu many times the Durus, very great Sahabi, a very pious Sahabi, a very brave Sahabi. So Ali radiallahu had him go and meet with Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu anhu. Now this hadith is authentic. Qaqa'a ibn Amr al-Tamimi, he goes, he meets with Zubair ibn Awam, he tells him, what is your niyyah? Is your niyyah that you want to make, you know, take the bay'ah 
to yourself, Zubair ibn Awam says no. It's not our niya. We are not trying to split from Ali radiallahu anhu. But we will not give the bayah until the murderers are caught. Ka'ka ibn Amr al-Tamimi, he said, we are in agreement with you. We want to catch the murderers as well. But you should give the bayah so that we can do it together. I mean, we shouldn't hold off the bayah for this uh, yani, case to be solved. They had a, a, a discussion, but they came to a sulh. I mean, they came to an agreement. Zubair ibn Awam, Talha ibn Abdullah, Ka'ka ibn Amr al-Tamimi, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Aisha radiyanha, they all came to an agreement. There was no disagreement amongst them. They said, okay, let us focus on catching the murderers. And at the same time, let us come together and give bayan. And we will work everything out. But right now, we cannot have a split in the ummah. Both of them agree. Tayyib. At this time, the agreement came forward. They said the next morning, they will gather the Muslims in the masjid and they will make an announcement of the conditions for bayah. Yani that Zubair ibn Awam, Talha ibn Abidullah, Aisha radiyan, we will give bayah to Ali radiallahu anhu. But the conditions are that the murderers will be first and foremost caught and this and this. And both sides agreed. So now alhamdulillah, everything is good. No fighting. No military action against each other, none of that. In the Sahih Hadith, Abdullah ibn Saba and other of the Yahud, Munafiqun, and the Khawarij, they met that night. They said that because they were there in the negotiations, they said if this sulha goes forward, we are the ones that are going to get killed. Because they knew that them and their companions were behind the murders of Uthman Radiyan. They said they will find the murderers sooner or later and they will be punished and maybe they'll rat on us, maybe they'll tell us, tell on us that we were involved in it and then we will be killed and the Muslims will be back together. We can't let this happen. So what did they do? And again, as Ibn Jarir al-Tabari and others have pointed out that no Sahabi was involved in this. None of the Sahaba were involved in this. So now, what did they do? Abdullah ibn Saba and others who were at, with the ranks of Ali radiyanhu attacked Zubair ibn Awam. In many ahadith later, some of their companions will even admit to this. They will admit that we were the ones that initiated the attack upon Zubair ibn Awam. And they sent the news back to Ali that we have been attacked. Yani they initiated the attack from amongst the ranks of Ali radiyanhu. But as they were initiating, they were sending messengers back to where Ali radiyan was camped, saying that we just got attacked. Yani classic disinformation uh, tactics that the Yehud and Munafiqun are still using. Here, in this surprise attack, because Zubair ibn Awam and Talha ibn Abidullah and other of the Sahaba were not expecting an attack. They, they were sulha. The next morning was supposed to be an announcement. They were, their arms, their, their guard was down. They were attacked. And Zubair ibn Awam and Talha ibn Abidullah are, are harmed. They are harmed. A fight breaks out now. And obviously at that time, people used to be armed. Even though they were regularly traveling, they were armed. So the fight broke out. In the Sahih Hadith, Aisha radiyanha, she was yelling from her camel. And again, she had a lot of haya. Aisha radiyanha, her, her haya was a lot. Today, we have people named Aisha, but I wish they would follow her example in her haya. Even at this time of battle, she didn't want to come out from even behind the curtain. Let alone, yani, just uh, wearing an abaya and things. She, was, she would be in this little box that had curtains on the sides. And she didn't want to come out of it, which would be sitting on top of her camel. So she didn't want to come out, but she was yelling to the Sahaba, to encouraging them not to fight. That even if you're being attacked, don't fight. And this is amazing because we look at these ahadith and contrast them to what we find 
in the books of the Rafida or the Orientalists or some of the Ahl Sunnah who didn't do proper research and say, oh, Aisha led an army against Ali. This is fiction. I and mean, it's worse than Disney. Here, Aisha is telling them, we don't want to fight. And when Ali Radian heard the news, he told his Ashab, even if you're being attacked, don't retaliate. Don't fight. But as I said, most of these are tabi'un. And once a, a fight begins, once that spark is lit, it's very hard to stop it. I mean, the fight began. Ali Radian, who in the Sahih Hadith, he says, I'm worried about Umm al Mu'mini. I'm worried about Aisha radiyanha. So he tells her brother Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr that I want you to try to make your way to your sister to make sure she's okay. He's also not saying attack Aisha and billah. Altogether, in this battle, about a hundred people were killed. Amongst them, about seven or eight of the Sahaba. And this is unfortunate, but this happened. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, at this time, he's trying to find his sister, but there's a battle going on. And he is from the side of Ali. So many of the people who are with Aisha, they didn't know his intent. They're not allowing him to get there. The army of Ali radiyanhu, and the people that were with him, they were obviously more in number, and they were stronger in fighting. So they were easily, they were able to overtake and stop the fighting. But at this time, yani there are some very, very historic things that happen. And we'll discuss them, inshallah. One of them is where the incident got its name. And we see many people saying uh, the Ma'raka to Jabal. But this is wrong. We do not say Ma'raka to Jabal. Even if this is in the history books. Rather, we say Mu'kiya to Jabal. We don't say the battle of the Jabal. We say the incident of the Jabal. Jamal. Ma'raka to Jamal is to say that this was a planned battle. We say this was not a planned battle. So many of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a and the Kutub of Tariq, they will say Mawqiyah to Jamal, the incident of the camel. Because it was an incident, not a planned battle. In it, when Ali Radian who sent Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, the brother of Aisha Radianha, to his sister. When he was trying to get close, people were trying to push him back. And the Jamal, the camel, wouldn't sit. From the noise, it wouldn't sit. So he struck the feet of the camel to make it sit. And when it sat, he took his sister and he went with her. And she went with him. It was not as some of the fictitious accounts have come that Ali went and he cut the legs of the camel. This is all fictitious accounts. It might as well be made in Hollywood. If you look at Tariqh, Ali Radian wasn't even there at the incident. And at that place, it was Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, the one that hit the feet of the camel, and that was only to make the camel sit, so he could take his sister out of these fitting. Ali radiyanhu sent women from his own household to go and be with Aisha radiyanha, and to make sure she's okay, and sent guards, including Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, from his people to make sure that she's safe. When Aisha Taraniha was safe, and when she had been fed, he made ikram of Aisha. He sent food to her, he sent drink to her, to make sure that she's fine. Then he had her escorted by her own brother, because he was mahram to her, back to Medina. And Aisha Taraniha in the Sahih Hadith, she said that I have no complaints against Ali, at the way he treated me. Rather, she said that if I knew this would happen, I would not have left Mecca for Basra. This was a Sahih Hadith from Aisha Taradiyanha. Under the protection of not only Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, but Hassan ibn Ali, Aisha Taradiyanha went back to Medina. Now, I want to mention a Hadith that Ibn Hajar has mentioned in Fath al-Bari, in the famous book Fath al-Bari. It is also reported by Imam al-Hakim in his Sahih, Ibn Hibban in his Sahih, uh, Al-Bazzar, Al-Tahawi, Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, Ibn Abi Shayba, Tabrani. All of them have mentioned it. Ibn Hajar reported it to be a Hassan, a reliable rawaya. 
And I want to mention this because this is another miracle from the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. While Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was alive, I'm going back in history now. Okay, we are, later we're going back. He told Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanhu, سَيَكُونَ بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ عَيْشَةَ أَمْرٌ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in a reliable narration, he told Ali radiyanhu while Rasulullah was still alive, that there will be between you and Aisha an Amr, like an issue will come. Not, not Marika, not a battle, not an ikhtilaf, but an issue will happen. Ali radiyan said, Baini wa baina ummi, and between me and my mother, Ya Rasulullah. And look at the love and respect Ali radiyan had for Aisha radiyan. And in, that's why we see the Rafidah today, they are not followers of Ali radiyan. We are followers of Ali radiyan. We love Ali radiyanhu, we love Abu Bakr, we love Umar, we love Uthman, we love Aisha, our mother, radiyallahu anhu. We respect them all. But look at the Rafidah and their attitude towards Aisha radiyanha and what they say. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Naam. said, yes, between you and Aisha. Ali radiyan again said, Ana, me? Faqala sallallahu alayhi wa Naam. Faqal Ali radiyanhu, Ashqa'ahum. Ana, yani, I will be Ashqa al qawm in another riwaya. Yani, I will be the most disgraced, the most yani, cursed person, the most miserable of people from my people if I have any issue with my own mother, Aisha. Rasulullah said, La. He said, No, you're not. It is not like this. But he told her that when it happens, make sure you return her to safety. And he makes sure she's not harmed. Ali Radiant says, at this time, I remembered the words of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I thought to myself, at this time, I wish I had not left Medina. I had, not, I had listened to Hassan, I had not left Medina. But when he was happened, he made sure he fulfilled the order of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that Aisha Radiant was taken care of, Ikram was made of her, and she was returned safely to Medina. Zubair ibn Awam. Radiallahu anhu. We know that Zubair ibn Awam was given the glad tidings of Jannah. Do you know who Zubair ibn Awam is? From the Ashra Mubashra. Zubair ibn Awam, we spoke about him. If you if you've been in these durus or if you watch the durus, you have known him well. The brave Sahabi, the amazing, beloved Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, no doubt from the people of Jannah. Multiple times given the glad tidings of Jannah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told him, You will be a shaheed. Yani you will be a martyr. Sahih hadith. No doubt that he was fighting for what he understood to be haq and that he was a shaheed. Zubair ibn Awam, when he heard about this, he did not want to take any part in this. Even though he was being attacked, he went far away and as he did not want to be involved in the fighting, he moved away and he was asleep. A Khariji, somebody from the Khawarij, attacked Zubair ibn Awam while he was asleep. Zubair ibn Awam was an amazing fighter. We spoke about him. He used to be uh, uh, somebody you couldn't challenge. He was so strong and his iman and his abilities. But at this time he was asleep. When he was asleep, he was attacked and he was killed. This was not, and I will repeat this, this was not, third time, this was not at the command of Ali ibn Abi Talib. In fact, if you look in any of the authentic narrations in Tariq, in the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'ad of Tariq, or if you go back to Bidaya wa Nihaya or any of these books. I even went back and found the actual hadith in the Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba and the Musannaf and the Musnad Imam Ahmad, Sahih, that when this news was brought to Ali Radiyan, that Zubair ibn Awam has been killed, Ali Radiyan said, Bashir Qatil ibn Safiya, yani Zubair ibn Awam bin Nar. 
Ali radiyan said, whoever killed Zubayr ibn Abbam, give him the glad or the horrible tidings of a nar. He will be in the hellfire. See, this is very important for us to know because the Orientalists and the Shia, they paint a very different picture. But the authentic narrations paint a clear and different picture. Ali radiyan said, Bashir qatil ibn Safiya, yani Zubayr ibn Hawam bin Nar. There was a man named Ibn Jarmud. Ibn Jarmud was a khari from the Khawarij, or somebody influenced by the Khawarij. And he is the one, in some of the narration, he cut off the head of Zubayr ibn Abam and brought it back to Ali. In some of the narrations, he's the, he at least brought the news. When he heard Ali ibn Abi Talib, he had anger at this news. And Ali ibn Abi Talib say in the Sahih Hadith, that I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who's the Rabbi here? Ali ibn Abi Talib said, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that Zubayr ibn Abbam will be a shaheed. So whoever killed him, give him the black talent of Nar. Ibn Jarmuz killed himself. He committed suicide. Sahih. Because, I want to make a point here, the Khawarij, some of them, they have a bad intent. I mean, some of them, they were Munafiqun. But majority of them were not. They were zealous. They were people whose zeal surpassed their understanding. And that's what we see in the Khawarij in our time. Some of them, they are those who are paid by the Yahud and by the Kuffar to cause problems in the Muslim Ummah. And they've been caught many times, as I have seen videos myself of people that were killed fighting with the appearance of the people of jihad against Muslims, against Mujahideen in other countries. When they were caught, they were found not to have been circumcised. And what Muslim is not circumcised? And in these war kuffar, causing problems in the Muslim Ummah. The that is a group of them. But then the majority of the Khawarij in those times and our time, they don't know what they are doing. They are, again, people who are zealous. They have a zeal, but they are ignorant. And we see this a lot. We see a lot of people that they have a great zeal for Islam, but their ignorance makes it that they are misused. And they end up killing Muslims, not knowing. Ibn Jarmuz here was from them. That he had a good niyyah, but he didn't understand what he's doing. So when he realized that what he's doing is not pleasing Ali radiyanhu, he even killed himself, which is haram. Suicide is haram in Islam. Talha radiyallahu anhu. In some of the rawayat, it was the sword of Talha that was brought to Ali Radiyan, Ibn Jirmuz. But Talha Radiyanhu, he was again one of the people that was given the glad tidings of Jannah. From the ten, Talha bin Abaydillah. And Talha, we know about Khaybar and we know about yani, uh, so many different battles that he was involved in Uhud. He said this was the day of Talha. We spoke about his bravery and, his, and so many times that he got the glad tidings of Jannah at the lisan, at the tongue of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In fact, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him Talhatul Khair, yani Talha of good, Talhatul Jood, Talhatul Fayal, yani the successful, the one with the great characteristics. In so many ahadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praised Talha radiyan. And again, Talha was told that you will be from the people of Jannah, at the lisan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was given the glad tidings of being a shaheed as well. Just to understand the virtues of Talha, once Talha ibn Abaydullah, he received 700,000 dinar. And that's a large amount of money. And he couldn't sleep. He said, I have this wealth, and I'm afraid to be taken to account in front of Allah. It was halal, it was his wealth. But he didn't want to go and give hisab for it. So he went and he gave it all away. And when he gave away 700,000 dinar, and he had none of it left, he felt at ease. 
And when this news came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said, Talha is from the people of Jannah. This is how much he loved to give. Talha radiallahu anhu gets hit with an arrow. One of the khawarij, he shoots an arrow, it hits Talha. Talha radiallahu anhu does not react. He doesn't want to engage in a battle with Muslims. So he leaves, but from that bleeding, he becomes a shaheed. Talha radiallahu anhu, as Ibn Kathir has authentically mentioned. 30 years after he became a shaheed, paying attention, 30 years afterwards, a sahabi, a tabi'i, sees a dream. In his dream, he sees Talha ibn Ubaidillah, and Talha, he says to this tabi'i in his dream, that there is some water that is flowing on top of me, it's bothering this tabi'i, he tells this news to Talha's daughter. Talha's daughter, she's a grown woman by this time. Her name is Aisha bint Talha. Her name is also Aisha bint Talha. When she hears about this, she takes some of her family, some of the men from her family, her mahram, and she goes to where the grave of Talha radiyanhu is. And she has the grave dug up. And many, many men, from her own relatives and others, when they saw this, they went to go look at this. And all of them, they report, as Ibn Kathir, he says authentically, that when the grave was dug 30 years after the Shahada of Talha, his body came out and nothing, not even the hair on his head, not his skin, not his eyes, nothing was harmed. Nothing had deteriorated. His body was as if he died that day. No rigor mortis, his body was soft and it was perfectly fine. And there was a leak with some underground water that had come on his face. And they fixed the grave, they fixed the leak and they put it back and they hid it. They hid the, the location because they didn't want people to start doing bid'ah and shirk. But the people who saw this, all of them, they bore witness that this shaheed's body was untouched. This is Talha ibn Abaydullah. He also became a shaheed. Ali radiyanhu, he became very upset at this. Once again, he was very upset at what had happened. He gathered the Muslims and he told them in a very important khutbah that he gave. He said, this was not a battle. We did not come here to fight. Whoever started this, they were at fault. And if I knew who they were, I would have them punished. But these are our brothers. We will not take Ghanima from them. We will not take them as prisoners of war. Whoever throws their sword, whoever is not fighting, whoever enters the house or walks away, we, they are free, they are our brothers. Ali radiyanhu announced, no Ghanima will be taken. Whoever lost anything, we call our brothers to come and get their things and take it with them. This is not a battle, we are all Muslims. And here, those people from the Tabi'un that were with Talha and Zubair and Aisha radiallahu anhum, ikram was made with them. Food was brought for them. Clothing was given to them. Their, their, their belongings were returned to them. And they gave bay'ah to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And sulha was made. And no problem was, was moved from here. So this is the Mu'kat al-Jamal Jamal that happened. We don't call it a Ma'rika, even though some of the books of Tariq have it, because of what happened. In the Sahih Hadith, the daughters and the women folk from the household of Ali radiyanhu, they were crying. They were crying. Ali radiyan entered upon them. He asked them, why are you crying? They said, because... Muslim blood has been shed. This is how much love they had amongst the Sahaba. Ali Radiyan told them that this was written to happen. And this is something that Allah ordained. And don't cry, we will be with them in Jannah. Us and them, we will both be in Jannah together. We have no harsh feelings about them and they have no harsh feelings about us. 
whatever happened, happened, but they are our brothers and sisters and we will be together in Jannah. Here, as our, my own teacher mentioned, that we need to keep the hadith innam al-amala bin niyat in mind. That yes, there were two people, and yes, a fitna happened between them, but both wanted khair, we love both sides, there is no criticism of any side, it happened, and it happened. Sometimes between Muslims, a misunderstanding happened. And one of the very important reasons why this happened was to teach the Muslims how to deal with this situation. From that time till the Day of Judgment, no, there was definitely going to be fighting amongst Muslims. There were going to be misunderstandings. There were going to be plots by kuffar that were turned brother against brother. But how would they deal with the situation? Will they take ghanima from each other? Will they take the women and children as slaves from each other? Will they develop a hatred for each other? No, they should not. If two Muslims get into a disagreement, we need to make sulha as soon as possible between them. And then they should not hold that grudge. Ghanima should not be taken from each side. Takfir should not be made of either side. Muslims need to come back and make islah. This is a lesson that had to be taught to this ummah and it was taught at the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum here. Another example that some of the imma and ulama have given, they said an example is of Muslims that are traveling in a desert and there is no stars, it's a cloudy night. And they have a disagreement about which way is the Qibla. Some of them think maybe Qibla is one way, they're making ishtihad, and others may think Qibla is another way. And they both make their ishtihad and they both make their salah. The next day, even when they realize where the Qibla was, the group that was mistaken is not criticized. Do you understand? Yani, they both made ishtihad, they both prayed. The ones that made a mistake, should they repeat the salah? No. The hukam here is the salah is not repeated. The salah is not repeated. They made their ishtihad, they prayed, their salah is accepted. See? Or they criticize, do you go back and say, ha, ah, you guys were wrong. Oh, you guys are this, you're ignorant. No. The salah is made, it's done, you move forward. Even though one of them was right and one of them was wrong, but no criticism is due. Tell you? And here we'll bring the hadith that is muttafaqun alayh in Al-Bukhari number 6919 in Muslim hadith number 1716 that if a hakim, if somebody who has knowledge gives a verdict with ishtihad thumma asaba falahu ajran and if he reaches it he, he gets two rewards and if he made a mistake, he still has one ajr. What does that mean? If you have authority, or if you have knowledge, and you make istihad, and you are correct, you will get two rewards. One, for your niyyah, and basing your istihad on knowledge, and second, for being right. And if you have knowledge, and you, or you have given authority, and you make istihad, and you make a mistake, you will still get one reward for your good need. Even though it's a mistake. Okay? So when the Sahaba made their istihad, even if they were wrong, they will get a reward. We don't criticize them. And that is the thing with ulama as well. When you look at the four a'imma, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad, radiallahu anhu. Yes, I said radiallahu anhu. Out of respect and honor. Right? They made ishtihad on issues, on whatever dalail they had in front of them. If they were right, Allah will give them two rewards. If they were wrong, and definitely some of them were wrong in certain issues. Because either touching your aura breaks the wudu or it doesn't. It's one or the other. Either eating the camel meat breaks the wudu or it doesn't. Some ayyama took it does, some said it didn't. So one of the two will be wrong. We don't say that all four were wrong, were right in everything. At the same time, we don't criticize them. They were the a'imma of this ummah, we respect them. We don't follow them in a mistake. 
But we don't criticize them. We don't get disrespectful with them. We said they will have their reward. But if you come later on and continue the mistake, then you, will, then you are wrong in that. It doesn't mean that we justify the imma with false ahadith and, and, and making rad of sahih ahadith. No. Now, having said this, we have a fitna that was squashed. Some casualties around 100, 7 or 8 of the Sahaba. But sulha made between the Muslims. But now we have another aspect of the Ummah. This is Basra and Kufa in Iraq. We also have a large part of the Ummah in Sham. And the Amir in Sham, from the time of Umar radiyallahu is Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, one of the great Sahaba, one of the Sahaba that wrote down Wahi, one of the very brave and intelligent Sahaba. He is the Amir in Sham. Now, Bay'ah is being given by different areas. It's not like, you know, you got an online polling going on, everybody just goes and you know, puts their click. No. And in each area, the Umara, the, the Amirs of that area are giving Bay'ah. So in Medina, in Mecca, in Basra and Kufa, now the Bay'ah is given to Ali Radian. Sham has not given Bay'ah yet. So in this area, as the news is reaching Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he consults many of the Sahaba and Tabi'un and Ulema of Sham. And in their consultation, Muawiyah radiyan says, in the Sahih Hadith, he says, La shak fi fazl al-Ali. He said, there is no doubt regarding the virtue of Ali. Tayyip, understand this is the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that we have no shak. We have no doubt to the father of Ali Radiyan. And we have no doubt that he is from the people of Jannah. Muawiyah Radiyan, who in the different riwayat, he lists a list of the virtues of Ali. Radiyallahu He says, no doubt he was one of the earliest Muslims. He says, before me, Ali Radiyan became Muslim. No doubt he was an early Muslim. No doubt he was from the Sahaba of Badr. Muawiyah Radiyan is saying this. There was no hatred here. This is what I want to clarify from Sahih Ahadith. Because the kuffar, the orientalists, those who wish harm for Muslims, the rafidah, the filth, and others, the ignorant from the Ahlul Sunnah, have fallen for false narrations and painted a very ugly picture. In the Sahih Hadith, Muawiyah Radiyan says, no doubt, not only was he from the people of Badr, but he was from the people that were the ru'us, the heads of the people of Badr. Yani he was one of the first three in the duels in Badr. He is from the earliest of the, of the battles of Badr. And no doubt that he was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa throughout the battles. And other than in Tabuk, we talked about that, but throughout the battles. And no doubt that he was from the ones, from the most beloved of the people to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And no doubt that he's from the Ahlul Bayt, of the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he is the son-in-law of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he is the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he is from the people of Iman, and no doubt to the ilm, to the ilm of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu. The ilm of Ali radiyallahu who was praised by Muawiyah radiyallahu. In fact, you will see that Muawiyah radiyallahu would send questions to Ali radiyallahu for fatwa, even when they had khilaf. And we'll discuss this going forward. So he says, there is no doubt to any of these virtues. And there is no doubt that we are ready to give bay'ah to Ali. Radiallahu. But, he said that the death of Uthman cannot go unchallenged. We cannot go and give bay'ah without the justice for Uthman radiallahu anhu as Zubair ibn Awam and Talha and Aisha radiallahu anhum had also said 
Muawiyah radiyan said the same thing that until the death of Uthman radiyan who is avenged we will not give bay'ah as soon as Ali radiyallahu anhu avenges the death of Uthman we will give bay'ah Ali radiyallahu anhu sent Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajali who was a great Sahabi a great uh, yani, person of virtue to Muawiyah radiyallahu Muawiyah radiyallahu said the same thing to him now Jarir ibn Abdullah he agreed with Muawiyah radiyallahu and he took this news back to Ali radiyallahu anhu Muawiyah radiyallahu he had a valid point the Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah we say that he had a valid point that the murders of Uthman have to be brought to justice. And Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanu agreed to this point. Ali radiyanu had a valid point. We Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah say that he also had a valid point that the unity of the Ummah has to be given precedence. They both had their valid points. Muawiyah radiyanu did not give bay'ah to Ali radiyanu at that time due to a valid point even if we say that Ali Radian had greater virtue and greater right to the bay'ah at that time Ali Radian who he had amongst his ranks the khawarij who caused a problem and they were at fault the khawarij there they were amongst the ranks of Ali Radian who who were not from the Sahaba were at fault but we don't criticize Ali Radian for this because he didn't know who was who from the people. Having said this, one of the Khawarij, and his name is Ashtar al Nakhai. He is called Ashtar because he was a, a strong fighter, but his actual name is Malik ibn al Harith. According to the authentic narrations, he was not a Sahabi, but he was a strong warrior and a strong general, and he was amongst the ranks of Ali Radian. When Jarir ibn Abdullah, who was a Sahabi, who was sent by Ali Radian, who brought the news back to Ali Radian that Muawiyah is saying he's ready to give bay'ah, but the murders of Uthman have to be punished first. Ashtar al Nakhai, Malik ibn Harith, he spoke very harshly to Jarir ibn Abdullah in very harsh words. And he told him, Why did you not say this and this and this to Muawiyah? Jarir ibn Abdullah, even though he's from the Ashab of Ali radiyanhu, seeing that this conversation was not going in a good direction, he left and he left both sides and lived uh, a, a life alone. As many of the Sahaba they did at this time, they left both sides and just went and lived their own lives. Just to be clear, I mean, just to be clear, I, regarding Ashtar al Nakhai, I looked him up in the books of Rijal. Ibn Hibban has him as a Tabi'i, to be clear that he was not a Sahabi. Because the Shia, they've tried to pass him off as a Sahabi. Ashtar al Nakhai was from the Khawarij, but most likely not from those that were Munafiqun. Yani from those that had a good niyyah, because he was known for a lot of Salah. As Ibn Hibban says, that he made a lot of Qiyam. And that's a point for us. Sometimes you see somebody, and apparently they're very pious. They make a lot of Tahajjud and Qiyam al Layl, and they cry when they read the Quran, and you think they're right in everything. But we need to judge everything with Quran and Sunnah. And even if somebody is very pious in their appearance, but what they are saying is not from the authentic ahadith, or not from the correct aqidah, or not in what is mentioned in the Quran, then even if we respect their piety, we have to reject those aqwal. Because sometimes, like a brother, or a alim, or a mufti, or a sheikh says something, and we refute it with evidence. 
And people get upset with us. Oh, that brother, I know him from so many years. He prays Qiyamul Layl and he cries in the Quran. How can you say he's wrong? If he's wrong, he's wrong. <laughs> and if the Quran says something separate, different, opposite, if the Sahih Ahadith have something opposite to it, then even if we say we respect his piety and his Qiyam and his crying, we have to respect and love Allah and his messenger more. Ibn Jawzi and Ibn Al-Qayyim and others, they said, in, uh, when, when some of their own teachers were wrong, they said, we love our teachers, but we love the haqq more. So here, even if Ashtar was somebody who was known to be a very uh, yani, devout Abid, but his revolt and his causing a fitna between the Muslims was wrong. Jarir ibn Abdullah left. Ali radiyanhu, at that time, he moved his armies to Sham. And he had with him around 50,000 soldiers. Muawiyah radian, who also moved his armies to an area called Sifin. Sifin was a place between Sham and Iraq at that time. Muawiyah radian, according to the authentic sources, had about 60,000 soldiers with him. So he also had a large army. The area where they got to was an area that had water under the control of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. And when the camps settled, the camp of Ali radiyan did not have water. And the camp of Muawiyah radiyan is where the water was. The people from the army of Ali radiyan they went to the camp of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu to get water. The tabi'un that were with Muawiyah, the sahih hadith, they asked Muawiyah, should we let them have the water? Because when they would fight with the Romans, when there were battles, obviously not going to let the Romans take the water. That's a strategic advantage. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, a beautiful hadith, he said, wallahi, hadhi wal ikhwanuna, wallahi, these are our brothers. We are not here to fight them. And we will not treat them as enemies. And we will welcome them. Not only will you let them allow them to have water, but bring from the food that you have and feed them. And he, subhanAllah, sahaba, such great akhlaq. Today, a little thing will happen. A little disagreement will happen. We will be like cursing people's moms and cursing people's families and making takfir and calling each other kafir and mubtati and saying you're off the manhaj and you are a jahil. And astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. How can you call yourself Salafi if you don't follow the way of the Salaf? Look at how the Salaf dealt with each other, even in serious situations. How they made excuses for each other, how they made ikram for each other. Today, a 16-year-old kid will have some little thing he saw on YouTube, and now he will see a sheikh, and he won't say salam to him. He will see somebody older, I'm not saying salam, he's mubtadi'ah. <laughs> you don't know what a mubtadi'ah is. I mean, this is the jahl we have in our time. But look at the beautiful akhlaq of the Salaf. Ma'awi Radyan said, We are here not to fight, but to negotiate with our brothers. Let them have what they want. At this time, Ali Radyan, who, he gives a khutbah to his people. He tells them that we are not here to fight. We are here armed. We have an army because we do want to make sure the Muslims come together, but we didn't come here to fight. At this time, Muawiyah radiyanhu captures a Roman with a letter from the king or the leader of the Romans to some of the Christians in Sham to try to revolt. And Muawiyah radiyan sends a letter to the Roman king saying that this issue is between our brothers. Wallahi, we will unite against you. Don't think we're divided against you. And it's an important lesson because today what happens is... Our Muslims, when we disagree with each other, we start begging the kuffar for help against Muslims. We saw one of the kilab, I'm not going to mention who he is, I might offend some people. But they call him a shir, a lion. I saw him, him himself, I'm not, not like here until. I saw a press conference he gave in a kafir country. I'm not going to mention the country, France. And in this conference, he was begging kuffar to help him against Muslims. Against a group of Muslims that were bringing the sharia. 
They were bringing the Quran and Sunnah Even if he had disagreements with them He should have dealt Within the Muslims with them It is not right To go and beg kuffar for help Against the Muslim If we have disagreements We need to bring the Quran We need to bring the Sunnah We need to bring the Sharia And solve our disagreements Even if you have a disagreement Even if you think they're harsh Even if you think that they have any aspects that you don't agree with Bring the Quran, bring the Sunnah Sit down and deal with it Bring other Muslims and sit down and deal with it Don't bring kuffar This is not the way of the Salaf of this Ummah And this is what we see The Sahaba stopped They didn't allow the kuffar to come In the middle of them But unfortunately A problem will break out and inshallah in the next dars we will discuss what happened at Safin and how the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah in the light of the authentic sources deal with that situation. Zakumullahu khairan.